bless you all. Welcome to church this morning. Thank you, Jesus. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 No other place I'd rather be than here in his presence. Oh, moving in our midst, working mightily within us and through us to fill us, strengthen and empower us. Well, as we continue to worship the Lord with the Lord's tithe and our offering, I'm reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 7. It's a very familiar verse, especially for tithe and offering. But it says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That very first line says, so let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart. We're to give with purpose. Amen. How many give with purpose? Amen. Give with purpose. Yes. What purpose do we have? The purpose of God's way is greater than my way. His ways are higher than my ways. God can do more than anything I could possibly think or imagine and wants to. So when we give, it's not out of fear. Oh, I just hope something happens. Or, oh, Lord, I need to beg him for something. Like, oh, please let this happen. No, I can give with confidence, knowing that my God is going to supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I give with purpose. I give with intent. I give with confidence, knowing that God is able to make all grace abound toward that you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. How many are giving with purpose this morning? Yes! yes. Ushers, go ahead and pass out the offering envelopes this morning. I just wanted to remind you of that. What a good thing it is to give with purpose. Thank you, Jesus. And as the ushers are passing that out, we do have a few announcements here this morning. This week is our um, Vendors Expo this next Saturday. And so if you haven't yet, uh, please sign up out at the entryway if you can help. I know that the help we need right now is to set back up for church. Right around 3, 3.30 if you want to come on, make your way out. As the vendors will be taking down, all of the chairs will need to be put back up. Cameras back where they need to be and everything ready to go for Sunday. Cleaned up, things looking sharp, nice and neat. Takes a lot of work. And so many hands make quick work. And so I would appreciate if you can help out on that Saturday for sure. Um, also today, immediately after church, after the Spirit's done moving and God's uh, healing people and we're seeing souls saved and just good stuff. Um, when the church service is over, we are going to be taking down our chairs today. All these chairs will need to get stacked up, probably about six, seven high. We're going to, the ushers will help move things over here. If you can stick around and help with that afterwards, uh, like I said, many hands make quick work, and we would appreciate that very much. Thank you, Jesus. Um, also that Saturday, I just encourage everyone to come out, walk around, take a look at what everyone's selling that day. And uh, let's make some good traffic for those that are coming out here. It's, it's a good thing. It's a wonderful uh, fundraiser for His Hands Extended Food Pantry. So you are doing a, a good deed and just a wonderful thing and reaching out and seeing great things uh, through His Hands Extended Food Pantry. But I wanted to bring that up as well. Also, um, I just wanted to remind everyone about the Maryland Enrichment Center. They have the Thanksgiving dinner as well as the Christmas Joy dinner. If you can help out, they are uh, due to certain... certain Circumstances and situations, the, uh, they are only having carry out or delivery. So they need delivery drivers. Um, they get a lot of uh, uh, people that need food that day or would like food that day, and they're also going to need a lot of delivery drivers. And so if you can help out in any way, please um, get a hold of the Maryland Richmond Center, 536-4226. Uh, um, reservations are required. Uh, if you need a dinner or know someone that needs a dinner, reservations are required for this. Again, uh, that's through the Maryland Enrichment Center. If you can help out, that'd be a wonderful blessing. It's a wonderful thing. That's for Thanksgiving, uh, going to be on Thanksgiving Day, and then Christmas Joy Dinner is going to be on the 22nd of December. If you can help out in any way, that would be great. I believe that's all the announcements that we have. The ushers have that taken up. You did not take that up. They're taking it up now. They're coming around. Everyone's looking at me like, all right, what's he going to say now? I'm not sure. We're going to get there. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love coming to church. What a wonderful place to come together with like-minded believers 
And when you build up in the spirit of unity and the bonding of peace, the Bible says, there the Lord commands blessing, even life forevermore. And so when we come together to worship, just know that God has such wonderful blessings in store for your life. After they have that taken up, why don't we go ahead and stand to our feet? Oh, thank you very much. So the flowers that we have right here in, in the entryway, uh, family from our school, um, the uh, grandfather, one of my students' grandfather passed away this past week. And uh, so they just wanted to bless us with uh, one of the, uh, the flower arrangements from the funeral. And they just really thank you for the prayers. And uh, some churches still aren't even open. Some are uh, working through some things. And so we had spent a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time in prayer, and a lot of time just counseling and helping family out. So we just want to bless the Buki family and uh, say we're still praying for you. We love you guys. Uh, it's not an easy thing uh, to go through death and grief can kind of be tough at times, but I tell you what, that's why we have the Comforter, the Holy Spirit to help strengthen us, empower us, and fill us with his love, uh, knowing that their grandpa is dancing on streets of gold. There is no more pain, no suffering, and he's just uh, in the heavenly uh, arms of a heavenly father. So what a wonderful thing that is. We just want to thank the Buki family for that. Well, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. If you are not already, we're going to worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's make sure that I'm on. We're all good with the sound. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just love on Jesus here this morning. Just love on him right now. Let's lift our voice. Tell him how much we love him. We adore you, Jesus. Jesus, how we love you.
our inhabitants, our Savior, Redeemer, our lover of our soul. How we love you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence here today. Your anointing flows in this place. We surrender our life now. We offer you our worship as a pleasing sacrifice. Thank you for your presence here today. It's in Jesus' name. All the family of God say, Amen. 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 Let's give Jesus a big hand for praise.
Thank you for answering those late night calls that often led to middle of the night hospital visits. Difficult conversations helping people deal with hard circumstances. Thank you for be being willing to do hard things to help others be brave as they face the unimaginable. Thank you for sacrificing time and energy that you could have spent with your own families. Thank you for the countless hours you have spent praying for us all, the sleepless nights spent in prayer, and the burden that you carry for your church family. Thank you for the responsibility that you shoulder to minister the way that you do, for choosing to follow God's calling on your life. And I pray that in this season, that God would be your constant companion, and we thank you for your endurance as our spiritual leaders. May God fill you with the Holy Spirit and enrich your lives and those around you. Thank you for your service and know that we all appreciate your hard work. If we can give them another clap of thanks. And then if you can stretch out your hands, we're going to pray over them. You guys are leaving for vacation, right? Soon. Our two senior pastors. Paul's here. <laughs> Paul's here to... Uh, fill in the shoes. So let's stretch our hands out. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We praise you for the gift that you've placed right here in our midst. Lord, uh, we all know that they've had, had opportunities to go somewhere else, but they stayed where you placed them, Lord, and that has benefited us in so many ways, ways that, that we may never uh, comprehend until we get to heaven. So, Father, we ask you to bless them, bless them abundantly, Lord. As they travel this week, we pray for um, journey mercies over them, for angels guarding round about them. And we thank you, Lord, that they continue to be good stewards of everything you've given them, people, the property, um, finances, Lord. They, they continue to be faithful, Lord, in what you've given them to oversee. And, Father, we thank you for strength. We thank you for um, energy. We thank you, Lord, that they walk in divine health and that no weapon formed against them will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes it'll say Jesus Christ, and sometimes it'll say Christ Jesus. And that's very important because he's the mediator between God and man. And so when you see Jesus, the term Jesus Christ, it means us to God, man to God. And when you see the term Christ Jesus, it's talking about God to man or God to us. So in relationship, so when you see Christ Jesus, you can say, whoa, okay. I'm listening. What's God doing for me? What's his relationship with me? And when we see Jesus Christ, it's okay. How am I applying my life? What am I doing? How am I to serve and, and, and worship and honor? And so um, it's just very important, by the way, read your Bibles. You're reading your Bibles, right? I mean, read your Bibles every day. Make sure you get the Word of God into you. It's a seed. And the more you put this seed into you, the more will come up. But if you never put the seed into you, what's going to come up is weeds and thorns and thistles. Amen. 
So read your Bible. Everyone look at somebody and tell them, read your Bible. Praise God. Read your Bible every day. Every day get it in you. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, let's go ahead and, and pray. Thank you so much again for, you know, for such a great honor. I, I was kind of taken back. So thank you so much. Um, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we open up your word, I know that revelation will come deep within us. Father, your word will stir in us, Lord God, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll find areas of our lives being rekindled, renewed, reestablished. We'll find our lives being, being lifted, Lord God, like with helium put into a balloon. We'll, we'll, we'll rise up mightily because of your word and your spirit. That's manifesting in every one of us today. Open our eyes to your word. Open our ears to your word, Lord God, so that we can walk in the light of life. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen and amen. Praise God. You know, uh, even you know, everyone watching over the internet and listening by radio, and you might be a good person. You might be a really, really nice person. But the truth is that in the scope of life, your fullness of your life, you don't really have a lot of worth or value unless Jesus Christ finds you and brings out of you all the potential that nobody else could ever see, that nobody else could even imagine, even you. Uh, you know, every one of us, when we that have children, we want to see the best for our children. And uh, sometimes it, it doesn't work out the, what we're wanting, what we're, what we're seeing. And, but Jesus has a remedy for that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The first thing that I, I, that I recommend is that we, have, we consider um, the achievement of the Lord Jesus, the history of the Lord Jesus, and the greatness of Jesus. And when we do that, we'll actually... Uh, start to believe in what he's done for us, what he's done in us, and what he will do through us. Uh, you're part of an incredible plan. Amen? <clears throat> but this world has been programmed now to destroy that plan, to overturn the apple cart, if it were, you know, to, to, um, to throw monkey wrenches in your spokes, to put speed bumps on your path, to to lasso you and tie you up, you know, to try to, to uh, hobble you, to keep you from all that God has for you. You know, whenever the beginning was, you know, um, it, he, Jesus was already there. And I'm, we're going to rehash a little bit of stuff, but I'm going to go on from where we've been. And it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Say that with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Genesis 1-1, read it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1-3, read it with me. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So we see that Jesus, He's the creator of all that exists. Jesus created us with his, with his, here, he created everything that exists with his words. But we're different. We're different. Yes, he did use his words to create us. He said, let us now make man in our image and after our likeness and give him dominion over all the works of our hands. But it was more than that. No other creation did he have a hands-on project. No other creation. He spoke everything into existence, the hippos, the chickens, the mice, the eagles, the sun, moon, stars, the trees, everything. But when it came to us, when it came to mankind, the Bible says that he fashioned and formed us, fashioned us out of the dust of the earth. We went over that the last time we talked and looked at this, when he came into this earth, how he did that again to bring into a reality of the value of a person, no matter how low they might seem to be. And so he, he handcrafted mankind. And when he handcrafted us, the Bible says he, he said it was very good. Amen. Everything else was good, but it was very good when he spoke and handcrafted mankind. 
in um, in Colossians or in Hebrews, the first chapter and the second verse. It says, "In these last days, see, read this with me. In these last days, God the Father has spoken to us by His Son." Whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. He is the, you know, he, he came to this earth, and we say, well, he was the son of a carpenter. You know, he was a he was a carpenter, but he was he was a skilled builder. He was the general contractor of everything that exists. The father, he was the architect. He's the one that planned everything. Jesus is the general contractor that created everything, made everything out of nothing. And then the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead who breathes life into everything that Jesus touches, everything that Jesus implements. He breathes life into it. And so in Hebrews, in the first chapter, in the third verse, it says this, read this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's why Jesus says the words that I speak to you, they're, they're spirit and they're life. They're more than just words. They're creating substance. When we read his Bible, we're putting seeds of his creating substance within our lives that will change us, lift us, empower us, better us, bring about all that he's planned for us. Look at in Hebrews, uh, the first chapter and the 10th verse. Read this with me. In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Psalms 147 and 4, it says, He tells the number of the stars, and He calls them all by their names. Each one has a name. There's trillions upon trillions of stars. Just in our, just in, in our, our uh, the Milky Way galaxy, there's trillions of stars. And there's trillions of galaxies. It's, it's phenomenal. He knows them all by name. He, he created each one. Just as personal as you would be when if you would build something. You'd have more of a personal knowledge of it. More personal value in it, wouldn't you? Well, that was Jesus. And then after everything he created, he creates mankind. He creates Adam and Eve. He creates Adam from the dust of the ground. He takes a rib out of Adam and then builds a woman, a woe man, you know, just a, a, um, a, 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 a more of a classy creation. More of a, it was, someone once said, yeah, he, 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 he figured out the flaws after the first one and then made the second one, right? But it was, it was more of, he, he handcrafted her and uh, for mankind. And so that's why the Bible says, man, when you find a wife, you find a good thing and favor with the Lord. It, it never says in the Bible what the woman finds uh, when she gets a husband. But the, the husband finds a good thing, praise the Lord. And so we're blessed. So here, here it is. But this masterpiece, this, this incredible masterpiece that he created, uh, it, it, because of... Uh, it, they allowed sin to enter into their life. They allowed um, uh, they, they allowed corruption to come into their hearts. They allowed distortion, perversion, darkness to enter into their lives. The result was an earth cursed life, and um, the, and, and this earth has an earth cursed system to it. That's why. We, we see the corruption that we see in the earth, in every element. It starts out good, doesn't it? We'll take the medical industry. I'm not picking on anybody, but I mean, you know, whatever. But the medical industry, start out a good thing. Let's help people. Let's help people. Now it's, let's get rich. Let's get rich. Um, not everybody, but a, a lot of the people, they start out just, I just want to help people. I just want to do good. And pretty soon they see dollar signs. All of a sudden they see that they can cut corners. They can, they can relax in areas. They don't have to be as skilled anymore. They don't have to do what they're supposed to be doing. And pretty soon, it, and it's just so I can keep getting a paycheck. Same with the, um, uh, uh, 
you know, pharmaceutical industry. Praise the Lord. I believe God gave doctors and nurses. I believe God gave the, the, uh, the different um, herbs and medicines for man so his body can rebuild, help rebuild and, and renew. But all of a sudden, we, they find out, wow, we, can, we don't even have to cure anybody. We can just keep them giving them drugs and uh, where they're dependent on it, and we'll just keep raking in the cash. Everything starts out with good intention. But the system of the world, everything ends in corruption, distorted politics, my land. That's just unreal how, how, how defiled and distorted it is in the day we're living. And, and uh, it's always been, though, everything. Starts out good. We're born, we're born into this world. No, no child sits around, you know, playing when they're four, five, six, seven, eight years old, nine, ten years old, thinking, man, I sure hope I'm a hobo one day. I sure hope I have to rob clothes from a clothesline of some family and maybe steal an apple pie that's, you know, that's cooling off on a windowsill. I don't know if you ever do that anymore or not. But uh, I, I, you know, I don't think anyone thinks that. I, I don't. They all think, man, I'm going to be a pilot when I grow up. I'm going to be an engineer when I grow up. I'm going to be a, a fireman when I grow up. I'm going to be a physician when I grow up. And, and yet, how many really obtain that? Maybe it's in the area of sports. I'm going to be the, you know, a, a superstar in some in, in football or basketball or something. And there's only such a small, small percentage of anyone that achieves even part of what they're really believing for in their lives. And a lot, when they do achieve it, the corruption that's involved in obtaining it destroys them. Corrupted system. Now, we didn't ask to come here. I don't, raise your hand if you asked to come to the earth. Not a one of us. God put us here. He's the one. He knew. The Bible tells us that he knew the exact place that you were supposed to live, the exact geographical place that you were supposed to be. He knew the exact time that you were going to be here. He always knew it. And when he brought us here, then there was a purpose for it. There was a purpose not to be uh, not to be under the weather, not all the time, not to be uh, on, on a, have a problem after problem after problem in our lives all the time. It's not to be hobbled or, or kept in bondage. It's not to walk down a dead end street day after day after day in a dark alley somewhere, no light, and wondering what in the world's going on with my life. That's not the intention of the Lord. He said it was the thief that came to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I've come to give you life, and life, what? More abundantly. Not life eventually, more abundantly. He came to give you an abundant life. All the deterioration that comes is it, it, it's due to a lack of our focus in the right place. If we look to Him... He says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And the Bible says in the last day, when all the problems come, when all the stuff that we're seeing and, and knowing about now in the world happen, look, look up, change your focus, because your redemption draws nigh. I, he, God's saying, I want to fulfill all that I have for you. I don't want to leave one stone unturned. I'm going to make sure you find everything that's supposed to be in your life. All the greatness, all the wonderful things. I want it for you. Amen? But here, man, he sinned. He brought corruption into his own life. He brought corruption into this world. Imagine if you made, say, a vase... And it was your master artist in this vase was just it, it oohed and odd millions, and it was the most valuable, most expensive vase in the world. And by <clears throat> foul play, a corruption somehow, somebody took that vase from you, and it was a legal thing. And they used it as a garbage can. And when you'd see that vase, you'd see it dirty and filthy all the time, cracked not being used right, your heart would sink. I didn't make it for that. It's being abused. It's being misused. 
What about if you had a child and the child was kidnapped and all of a sudden that child is being abused and misused? What would it, what would it take you to maybe purchase that vase back? Would you be able to give everything you have? How about the child? You might be more willing to give everything you have and some may even be willing to give their own life for the child. But the problem is we wouldn't be able to properly redeem that child. They'd still have wounds and scars that they would never be able to get over. They'd still have issues in their life that would hold them and keep them in bondage from all the great things they could have had. But God, everyone say with me, but God. Amen. Jesus, he, 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 the love of his creation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we see in John, the first chapter in the 14th verse, it says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Here he is, the full of glory, all the glory of God. Here he comes. And we beheld that, that he was willing to come into this earth. Can you imagine? Jesus, what, what did Jesus really leave to come into this earthly cursed time capsule? He created time, but he's never experienced time. Living in time, he's eternal. He never experienced even the corruption. He saw the effects of it. He saw a life that was filled with depression. Living in a cave the rest of his life, Adam. Filled with sorrow, filled with remorse. He sold everything that God created, gave it away. That's why the Satan, when he came to tempt Jesus... He said, if you're really the son of God, he says, bow down and worship me. He says, I'll give you then all this, everything. He could say that because legally he owned it. But Jesus says, I, I, it is written, worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. He's saying, I'm going to get it all right, but I'm not going to do it by worshiping you. I'm not going to do it in a corrupt way. I'm not going to do it in a, in a way that's going to cause uh, more problems, greater difficulty. We're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're, we're, I'm here to save. I'm here to redeem. And that's who he is. He's our redeemer. The redeem in the Hebrew means to buy back or to marry. If some woman would have lost their husband and the next of kin uh, would, would male would have the opportunity to marry that woman so that she would have a home and a house and not starve not have to uh, live in as an ill repute uh, she would she would be given security and safety and she'd be taken care of Jesus leave to come into this earth curse system, this time capsule of curses, of doom, of disruption. Well, it says in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, in the ninth verse, it says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, read it, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. When he came to this earth, he gave up everything. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's eternal. He is the sum total of the glory of God. He's the revelation of the glory of the Father. And he gives this up to come into this earth and taste the sting of death. To feel the hardship, to go through the weariness. Jesus wept. Jesus got tired. He grew weary. He was sore. He went through everything that we go through. 
He gave up never having to experience any of this for you and for me. In fact, in uh, Herb's translation, the easy to read version, it says this, read it with me. It says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know that he gave up his heavenly riches for you. He gave up everything so that you could be richly blessed. Well, there's different ways of, of blessing that comes to us because of Jesus. There's different avenues. There's different, there's different elements that, of blessing that comes to us because he gave up what he had as rich. Not once did Jesus ever, by the way, use his supernatural power for his own convenience. Not once did he ever use the supernatural power for his own comfort. Ever. Ever. He walked many miles in extreme heat just to deliver a message. And he could, he, he could have been translocated. He did it after he rose from the dead. He walked into a room through a wall. At times he had nowhere to sleep. Luke 8 and 58, remember the verse? He said, foxes have holes, birds in the air have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. He could, have, he could have made something appear. He could have made a, a cloud bed appear that would nestle them and hold them better than any, uh, you know, goose down mattress that we could find. In Isaiah 53 and, and 3, it says, He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. His family didn't even believe in who he was. His brothers didn't. His sisters didn't. He wasn't just forsaken by man. He was the only one ever in existence to be forsaken by man and God. And he cries out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We'll never ever say that. Never have to say that. But he did. Because of your value. And Isaiah, or listen, in judgment, they spit on him. They beat him. Not just with their hands, but the Bible says with reeds. They beat him. They beat him with a cat of nine tails and ripped all the flesh and, and skin and, and meat off of his bones from the back of his head to his heels of his feet. They pulled his beard out. He never once did anything for his own comfort. Now he can be a faithful high priest to you. you you'll never go through what he had to go through. And you'll understand everything you're going through without condemnation, without criticism, but with compassion and love and care. Because you're that valuable to him. In Isaiah 50 and 6, read this with me please. Isaiah 50 and 6, everyone listening out there, let's read this together. It says, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. He was stripped and humiliated publicly naked on a cross. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And here's where I'm going today. Is there a significance to have a crown of thorns put on your head? It says in Matthew, the 27th chapter, in the 29th verse, it says, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They were mocking that he would be a, he's really a somebody. He came to his own, his own received him not. He came to the people that he was here to redeem and they rejected him, criticized him, mocked him, lied about him. 
the thorns on his head. Listen, they were two to three inches. It wasn't just placed nice and gently. It, it, it drove in through his skull. Thorns symbolize the consequences of our sin. Thorns symbolizes the curse of the earth that we'd have to drudge through, scrape through, try to get through in order to get to where we need to be. It's more than spinning our wheels. It's like having to walk a hundred miles through a, 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 a picker patches and briars, crawling on your hands and knees, try to get somewhere. Every one of us knows the issues of trying to get things going, and all of a sudden, it's like out of the blue, here comes a sucker punch. Out of nowhere, it seems, here comes some opposition. Here comes something that's going to slow us down, hold us, keep us back from what we're really wanting in life. But you know what? God wants more out of life for you than you do. He wants more out of life for me than I do. In Matthew, or in, excuse me, in Genesis 3, 17 through 18, it says this. Here, here's the consequence of sin. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. In other words, because you've done this. God wasn't cursing man. He was just, remember I had a, he, he was just holding up the package of seed saying, here's a good one. Here's a, here, he's holding up the package of seed saying, look at this, here's what it's going to produce. What you just did. He was just showing them what's going to happen because of what they did. And he says this, because you have heeded to the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Read it with me. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. It, uh, um, that's it. And you shall eat the herb of the field. I won't keep going. I didn't put it up. So he says thorns and thistles this earth is going to produce for you. Every one of us experienced the thorns and thistles of life. If you're living in New York City and never ever been in the country, it's going to produce thorns and thistles for you. Life's going to become difficult. Things aren't going to go your way. You're going to have to put more effort into what you're doing. Try to make something happen. Try to get some kind of gain in life. Jesus said, though, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world, yet lost your own soul? What would it profit you if you just knew how to work this system in the world? You just figured that out. Most people, they try all their lives by schooling, going to college, being trained how to work the system in order to get more in life. That's what they do to our... our, our uh, um, welfare system that they've taken from your social security that you paid in and they gave it to people that learn how to work that system you ever hear that term in order to get something out of it that's why people come to the united states we can work we can figure out a system here that will get more for nothing than any other country In John, the 19th chapter and the 15th verse. Listen, here he, he's, he's given a crown or, and a reed in his hand and a robe on his back. And they, they mock him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they bring him out. And, and Pilate they, uh, exhibits him to the public. And it says, Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Not the King of the Jews. He said, Behold the man. He's nothing. Why do you want to kill him? He's nothing. And here was their potential. 
Here was their Redeemer to bring them back to a place that they didn't have to work so hard. They didn't have to struggle so much. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Yet they fought against him. Even to the place of killing him. But they couldn't. He said, you can't kill me. I have to freely lay my life down. And he did. He not only left the riches of all heaven, of all of the eternal glory, to come here and live in this curse system like you and I would. He took it farther. He took all the curse upon his own life, every speck of it. To purchase us out of it so that we could have life and life more abundantly. They say, he isn't anyone special, only the creator of all that exists. He isn't anyone special, only the one that knows the names of every star in the universe. He isn't anyone special, only one that handcrafted us, who knew us before anything was ever created, who had us written in a book, our time, our abilities, our skills, all that would take place with us, not the bad, not, not after the earth curse system. This was without an earth curse system. And that's what he's given us an ability for. That's what he's redeemed us to. A place that we can find that which was meant for us without an earth curse system. Jesus is our redeemer. Look at it in Galatians 3, 13 through 14. You need to read this with me too. You might not believe it if I just said it. You've got to read this for yourself. Read this out loud. It says this. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He freed us. He freed us from the law of sin and death. He freed us so we can take hold of all that he intended for us from the beginning. In Colossians, the first chapter, the 13th and 14th verses is, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have what? Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We're redeemed from the curse. We're redeemed, but without knowledge of it, you'll still only get, you'll give more effort to try to work an earth curse system to get more out of life than to allow Jesus to accomplish for you and with you all that was written in the book about your life. That's why we yield to him. That's why we come to him. Jesus, I give up. I give up. I quit. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'll acknowledge you. You direct my path. You lead me and guide me. You show me a perfect way. You bring the blessing into my life. That's what the Christ Guarantees the Holy Spirit, the blessing of an eternal kingdom given to you here now in this world. But we struggle, we strain. That's what James says. Why do you, you know, why are there wars among you? Why do you battle with each other? What are the, what's the, he says because you desire to have and can't seem to obtain. You fight and struggle and try to get when I always just wanted to give it to you. It's not trying to figure out the best way to work a system. 
best way to work a system is college. The best way to work a system is the union. The best way to work a system is to know somebody that's in that put in these positions. The best way to work, a, uh, work this system for my advantage is to get a political edge. The best way is always a pecking order. We have a me pecking order mentality. If I can just get to somebody better than me, bigger than me. That's why Pilate said, behold the man. And that's all they thought he was. Nobody that could do anything for him. Yet he came to redeem them from an earth-cursed system. Where I don't have to grovel. I don't have to beg. I don't have to humiliate myself among mankind. I can stand as tall. Having done all the stand, he says, not to get from a system, having done all the stand there, stand there for, having the armor of Christ on your life. He'll open the doors for you. He'll pick you up by the hand. He'll brush you off. He'll heal your wounds. He'll bind them up. He'll help you. He'll heal your heart. He'll heal your soul. He'll take care of you. A woman at Jacob's well who came there at, at, at uh, uh, noon because she, she'd, rather, she'd rather experience the heat of the noon day than the heat of criticism from a community. Because she was married five times already and now she was just living with some guy. She was the one that everyone just looked down on and ridiculed and talked about. But Jesus says, I'll give you living water where you'll thirst no more. You won't have to toil for a quench your thirst. She says, how are you going to do that? Jacob's well's deep. You don't even have a bucket. He says, if you knew who it was that's asking you, for a little drink of water. You'd ask me. If you knew the gift that's in your presence right now, you'd ask me and I'd give you living water where you thirst no more. Out of your belly would just flow rivers of living water. He tells her everything about her life but never condemns her. Still saying, I'll give to you. I'll help you. Because he was Redeemer. And the Redeemer can only redeem. And so she runs back into town and she says, Come on, guys, you gotta. See, I think I found the Messiah. I think I found the Savior of the world. He told me everything about my life. And he still loves me. And they came out and listened to him and they said, Well, you know, uh, we believe what you said, but now we believe because we've heard them for ourselves. Somebody had to, to reach out and say, okay, Lord, I'll let you help me. I'll receive you as Redeemer. I believe your plans for me are better than my plans for me. When that happens, your life is so radically changed that you have to tell people. You have to tell them. You can't hold back. You can't say, well, I don't want to say nothing. What if nothing really works? What if nothing goes on? That's religion. Your relationship with the Redeemer. Jesus is Redeemer. The one that purchased all the desires of God for your life back. And the reality of that's in us. Even when we go through troubles and we go through hard times, man, we can still praise him and think this is just going to pass. What he's bringing about is far greater than what we're going through now. 
I know who he is. He will not leave me. He will not forsake me. He is the one that picks me up when I'm down. He brushes me off. He binds up my heart, my wounds, my soul, and gives me life and life more abundantly. See, the plans that he has for us, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, my plans for you are good, not evil. These are my plans for you, to give you hope, peace, and a future. To give you an expected end. Not an unexpected end. Man, I didn't believe that I'd end up this way. Parents that have wonderful, wonderful visions for their children, wanting the best for their children, end up seeing their children in prison. Maybe physically in a jail or maybe with a needle in their arm in prison. Or on their back with somebody they don't know in a prison. God never intended that for anybody, just like you never intended it for you from the beginning. But we're in an earth curse system. So to receive Jesus Christ as Redeemer is saying, I know you wore that crown of thorns for me. You took, you took the curse of this system for me so I can live from the kingdom of heaven. You translated me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of light. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, it says in verse 45 through 49, it says the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. See, Adam was innocent in his beginning, right? Jesus, though, was holy. There was a difference. Jesus didn't come to take. He came only to give. That was the difference. Adam in his innocence thought, I need to take to have a better life. Jesus came and never had that. He never used his supernatural power for any convenience in his own life, any comfort for his own life. He never did anything for himself, but only for you and me to please the Father. He came to give and to serve. That's why Jesus says, it's more blessed if you give than it is to receive. Because you now are acting just like Redeemer. You're saying, I've been redeemed and I'm confident of my redemption. I don't need to work a system to get. I can give and God will give to me by good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. People will even give to me. Blessings will come my way. Doors will open for me. Favor will be granted because I serve the living God. And him only do I serve. He goes on to say in verse 46, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. That's why we must be born again of the Spirit. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly, who've been born again. The same thing. He's redeemed us unto God. We become children of Almighty God. We now live from a kingdom made without hands. Supply beyond what we can imagine. He supplies all of our need according to his riches in glory. Not from working a system in this earth. And it says, And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Even our physical bodies will know redemption. No more zits. No more B.O. I don't have to go on, right? <laughs> no more weakness. No more, you know, struggling to just, oh, I, I, I got one more hour to put in and then I get to go home. A natural example of this point, by the way, is the two seas in the Holy Land, Israel. One is called the Sea of Galilee. 
It freely receives water into it, and then it gives water out. And because of that, it has a plethora of fish. It still supplies for all of the region. It has all kinds of vegetation. It's a good, good place. But see, the, 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 there's a, a river called the Jordan River that runs out of the Sea of Galilee, and it runs down into what is called the Dead Sea. And the reason it's a Dead Sea is it takes in that living water, but never gives it out. And because it never gives it out, nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Not a fish, not a plant, nothing. There's 28% salt. It's buoyant. You, you go in there because you're top heavy. You, you realize you're top heavy when you swim in the Dead Sea. You want to boot all the time. Your head's going to go down. Your legs are going to stick up. And you got to work at trying to, you, you never sink, but you got to work at staying upright. The Dead Sea only takes water in, never gives it out. Nothing living in it. The power of life-giving waters of the Sea of Galilee become dead when mixed with the hoarded waters of the Dead Sea. We all come into this earth vibrant, wanting to achieve. I'll be a doctor. I'll be an engineer. I'll be a scientist. I want to land on the moon. I want to fly a plane. Man, I want to own horses. I want to breed them. I want all these wonderful things. But listen, the system of this earth is the Dead Sea. And even when it seems like we are producing and growing and increasing, if it was by working a system in this earth, it's going to catch up to you. Ask Elvis, right? Ask Freddie Prince. Ask, um, uh, I can't remember the, a lot of the names in, 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 in Hollywood. Marilyn Monroe. Ask them. Find out. Look at what's taking place. There's a big price tag to get through the worldly system what you want to get. There's a huge price tag. The Bible says it's like taking coals into your own belly. You're going to get burned. It might seem to warm you for a while, but it's going to burn you. There's beauty in every one of us. There's potential in every one of us. There's life to give in every single one of us. And Jesus, he came. And on purpose, refused to work an earth system. Refused to. Multiplied fish for people and bread for people. Healed them all. Fed them. Took care of them. And then took all the curse upon his own life to redeem us. So the curse can be taken away from us. To redeem us from the curse that the promise of Abraham would come upon our life, the, the Holy Spirit. Without Jesus Christ, we're all destined to run into a dead sea. And we'd never know and see all that the Lord has planned for us this earth curse system devours everybody. Everyone born into it. And there's no escaping except one way. Jesus says, I'm the door. I'm the door. Here's the way. Come through me. Come through me. And he says, he's the only one with the key to heaven. He says, and I will open now for you a door into heaven. He loved us so much that he didn't just come to get us to heaven. He came to bring heaven to us. Psalms 139 and 16. New Living Translation. It says this. Read this with me. Okay. It says this. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. 
Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Do you really see now all that he has in store for you? It's beyond what we could ask or imagine, the Bible says. It's beyond. We just have to trust our Redeemer. He's our Redeemer. He isn't just an icon. He isn't just somebody that we say, you know, when we're mad or the word we use as a word we say if we want to get something in Jesus' name. He's given us authority in his name. But if we think that that's all that's invested in Jesus, wow, have we missed the boat. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus came to redeem, and he was rejected by those who were held captive that he wanted to redeem. And it's still happening today. He wants to redeem you, but you want to keep him at arm's length. You want to keep him away from you. I don't want to invest that much in giving my whole life when you don't realize he's invested everything to give you more life than what you have. Bible college students, we went to a mission on a mission trip to graduate for our college. You have to go on a mission trip. We went to Puerto uh, Rico, and uh, we, on, uh, we have a little mission on the bottom of the Oshunke Mountain. Beautiful place, and we decided let's go. We were witnessing on the streets, ministering in churches. Anyone that was on that mission trip in here? No. And so we go into um, uh, San Juan, and uh, where there is a village called the Pearl in English. And um, uh, it's, it's a place for down and outers. It's a place with, for drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have been abandoned by their families or homes or lost everything they had. People that have, have lived perverted lives and distorted lives, many with, at that time, even this had to be 20 years ago uh, that we first went there, with, that is, had ch sex changes. And we went there and the police, we, we were going there, and I had even uh, two high school students from here with me, and uh, there was our college classes, and um, we were going to go down there, and the police warned us and said, you don't want to go down there, they'll kill you. It, it was down, you had to go down these stairs underneath these piers, going out into the ocean. That's where they live. And we said, well, we believe that the Lord has told us to go there, so we believe that we'll be all right. He says, I can't go down there to help you. We Please don't even go down there. I said, okay. So we went, and we preached Jesus. We preached the Redeemer. That nobody's too lost. Nobody's helpless. Nobody is ever ever so bad that he will not come and pick us up and brush us off and change us. And people just cried. They said, nobody's ever told us this before. We didn't know this, that he, he came to give us life. He just didn't want us to give everything to him only for one day maybe go to heaven. He really wants to help us and change us. And we saw dozens born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. We cast devils. Every person there, even the high school students, cast devils out of people. It was phenomenal time. When we know the Redeemer, there's some power that you hook into that you'll never, ever know otherwise. The redemption story still and always will be the greatest story ever told. In Psalms 103, 1 through 4, last verse, it says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, go ahead and read it, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. 
Jesus was crowned with thorns to take the penalty of sin and destruction so he could crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. Amen. Amen. Redeemer. That's who Jesus is. I have a prophecy the Lord wanted me to deliver to you, and I wrote it down. And the Lord says to you today, what you see now is not what will be forever. There are many, uh, there may be trouble in your family, but it's not it, forever. It will not last. There may be trouble around you, but it'll soon disappear. Set your heart on my faithfulness and don't be distracted by the impossibility that seems to limit you. I am your father and I have plans to prosper you and to make you fruitful in my vineyard. So take rest in my work, says the Lord. Take joy in my love, says your king. This day I will open up your eyes to see my saving power. I have come. My redeeming grace will be unveiled before you. This is the day when I will rise to redeem your life and fully restore it back to me, says the Lord. From today forward, my presence will be upon you in unmistakable ways. My face will lead your steps and protect you from all that may come against you. Though a raging flood threatens you, I will lift you high, says the Lord, and you will see my glory. For the day of the Redeemer has come to you, says the Lord Christ. Amen. He's here for you. He's here for you. He did it for you. Now it can be a personal thing for you. Not something just to sing about. Not something to talk about. Something to live. When failure comes and we're struggling with disappointment, when our souls feel the sting of defeat and the race seems hopeless, Stop and think, my Lord has redeemed me. And at an immeasurable cost, he gave up everything, even his life, to redeem me from an earth curse system. A cost that no one will ever be able to measure and nothing will ever be able to calculate. Listen, if the Lord saw that in you, for which to pay with his own life the potential. What you're, what, what's been assigned to you is very all. His everything was given. Is it not worth the effort to rise and try again? To apply yourself and humble yourself to him again, if need be? To walk with him and worship him? And give him the opportunity to bring a redemptive flow into your heart, into your life, into your future. Embrace that life that he came to give you. The very price that redeemed you is yours. If you're out there right now or you're in here, And you've been feeling the weight of this earth curse system and the struggle and confusion. Not knowing and not understanding what tomorrow might hold. You can receive a Redeemer this morning that will guarantee that your tomorrow will be better than today and your next week will be greater yet and next month and next year. Because it's all been written in a book already. And it's above and beyond what you could ask or imagine. That's what he's here for you for. That's what he wants to do for you. That's what he wants to give you. Don't listen to people that'll preach and say, Oh, God doesn't want you to have a good life. You're supposed to live a miserable life. And, uh, 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 and we just, you know, we, we're just to serve him in hardship and then go to heaven one day. They don't know Redeemer. They don't understand redemption. No matter who you are, what you've been doing, what you're into, that has nothing to do with anything right now. All that you have to do is receive him as redeemer. 
So everyone in here, let's stand up together. And let's make this personal. Everyone listening by, uh, by video, by radio, uh, wherever you are in the world, today's your day. Now is the acceptable time. The doors are being blown open for you today. Your eyes are being opened to your destinies, your future, the goodness that God has for you today. Amen? Just close your eyes and lift your hands to Him. It's a simple thing to surrender. That's all he asks, that we surrender to him. We can say, you're my king, or you're just a man. It's up to us. Don't hold him at an arm's length anymore. Just allow him. Let him take you in your arms right now, or in his arms. Let him take you in his arms. Go ahead, just imagine him holding you and loving you and caring for you, helping you, healing the wounds of your past, healing the wounds of your present, destroying all the bondages and the walls that have been built up and giving you liberty. Just say, Jesus, Jesus. you're my Redeemer. I receive your redemption plan for my life. You've redeemed me from the curse. Because you were made a curse for me. And so I receive the abundant life, eternal life, a favored life, a good life that you've come to give me. In Jesus' mighty name, I'm free from all bondages. My soul's escaped from every snare, and I'm free. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus, you're my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer. And so I will live for you all the days of my life as you lead and guide my life. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen and Amen.